the main questions now uh, one can see the blatant uh, continuing attack of uh, Russia on uh, Ukrainian civil infrastructure and at the same time uh, we he hear uh, different voices from United States about the possible negotiation with Russia when from your point of view when uh, will be this the most suitable time to begin this negotiation and uh, do what do you think about now is it time or 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 it would be better to wait and to continue offensive military activities i don't think the time is now vitali <clears throat> i think the time the right time is when the ukrainians decide and i imagine <clears throat> that that time will be when the ukrainians have pushed the russians out of their country um at that time the but probably not until then um <clears throat> will the russians be ready to negotiate when they're pushed out of the country when the ukrainian forces push the russian forces out of the country then the russians will figure out that they can't win this war um <clears throat> and they will then come asking for serious negotiation but right now is not the time right now the ukrainian military is pushing the russians out the ukrainian military is winning on the battlefield so it's why would why would there be a ceasefire to allow the russians to stay in place when they're getting pushed out so no i don't think now's the time i think the time might be um if if the ukrainians decide the, the time might be when they have pushed the russians out mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think about the Crimea in Donb and Donbass? Uh, before the uh, open military invasion, uh, Western politicians, they tried to divide it, these two tracks. <laughs> now, when we, when we discuss the liberation of Ukrainian territory, it means uh, both uh, Donbass and Crimea. It's, it, in, yeah, in principle... Um, yes, all Ukrainian territories should be free of Russians, all Ukrainian territories. Donbass, Crimea should all be free of uh, Russian forces. Um, it doesn't have to all happen exactly at the same time. Uh, right now, there are forces being pushed out of Donetsk, uh, starting into Luhansk. Uh, there are attacks um, into Crimea. Um, so the military dynamic will determine um, how fast and in what order uh, the Russians are pushed out of all of Ukraine. Sooner or later, I think, the Russians will all be out of, out of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, from your point of view, should Ukraine liberate Crimea by the military force? I think liberating Crimea by military force will be difficult. Um, we see how the Ukrainian military is able to push on the Russians <clears throat> around Kharkiv, well, around Kiev and around Kharkiv and around Kherson. Um, the, the ground forces um, that the Ukrainian military has, has used in such skill and such effectiveness um, are the way to push the Russians out. The ground forces push Russians out. The artillery weakens <clears throat> the Russians, and the artillery damages their supply lines. Uh, but the ground forces uh, are the ones that actually push the Russians out, and they occupy, reoccupy, uh, deoccupy uh, Ukrainian territory. So that's what that would happen. To get ground forces into Crimea is more difficult than to get ground forces into Kharkiv um, or Kherson um, or Donetsk or Luhansk. Uh, getting ground forces into Crimea means going across a narrow five mile, eight kilometer isthmus. It's difficult to get there. So I think it would be difficult, um, but in the end, I think the Russians will have to leave Crimea. Uh, we, we know that uh, several days ago, European Parliament declared Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, and the NATO's uh, Parliamentary Assembly uh, made the same decision. 
uh, should we expect that uh, i don't know maybe soon or or late but uh, united states uh, so, uh, make the same decision i think so i think i think we will decide um that uh uh we can see what the truth is the truth of course is that the russians are terrorists um and they are using terrorism uh, against the ukrainians so every the world the whole world can see that they are terrorists um labeling them as a state sponsor of terrorism um, is a legal action um and a, it's a political decision that i think the Biden administration will come to. They're not there yet. Uh, Congress has been very clear. Our Congress has been very clear uh, that they think Russia is a terrorist nation. Um, as you say, there are other parliamentary bodies around the world who are making these statements, other nations um, who are labeling Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. So I think this will happen. I think, as you say, this will be sooner or later uh, the United States will label Russia a terrorist state. Maybe you heard that um, uh, former Russian president Dmitry Medvedev claimed that uh, through this decision about uh, uh, recognition of Russia as a terrorist state, uh, West, some global West, uh, tried to get frozen money and to spend this money Russian money, Russian France's money, uh, G7 and other countries, they want in, uh, to spend this money on Ukraine or just uh, get this money. Uh, <laughs> uh, is there is some sense in this statement? Uh, could it be the first step uh, to really get this money and to spend this money on Ukraine? Yes, I believe so. I believe that... Uh... <clears throat> that the $300 billion of Russian central bank reserves that are stored in G7 banks, so there's $300 billion of central bank, Russian central bank reserves that are in G7 banks. And that money is already frozen. And legal steps need to be taken in each of those countries <clears throat> to allow governments <clears throat> to take that money and put it into a fund for Ukrainian reconstruction, or put it into the fund that would allow Ukrainian government to draw on those funds to be able to pay the soldiers, or pay the healthcare workers, or pay the teachers, pay the government employees, pay the firefighters. Um, the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian government need this money. It's Russian money and the Russians are responsible for this war, the Russians are going to have to pay reparations to Ukraine. And so it's good that the Russians have put their money in G7 banks. That allows those G7 banks and those G7 governments to freeze and then seize that money and put it into a, an international fund for Ukrainian reconstruction and Ukrainian government. Uh, you are in in Washington now uh, after election. How you feel the atmosphere of Washington, and uh, do you see some changes in policy uh, toward Ukraine? I don't see changes in policy toward Ukraine after the election. Uh, this is what I said before the election. And that's what I say now. That is, before the election, there was overwhelming bipartisan support for every Ukraine assistance package that came before the Congress, overwhelming bipartisan. And the election won't change that very much. Maybe a, a, a one vote here or there it won't change it very much. The next time there is a vote, which will come up soon, on the next big package, $37.7 billion more for Ukraine, <clears throat> will come up in the next month or so for a vote. And I predict that, again, there will be overwhelming bipartisan support for that assistance package for Ukraine. On the background of this blatant attack on civil infrastructure, could Ukraine expect to get more sophisticated weapons, maybe aircraft, maybe more 
sophisticated uh, missiles or something like that? I think the answer is yes. I think there's the, the argument for longer range HIMARS, longer range weapons, heavier and, and uh, more capable anti-aircraft weapons, more anti-aircraft, air defense weapons. Um, I think those arguments are stronger now. They're even stronger. They were strong before, but these attacks, these terrorist attacks, these criminal attacks um, on civilian infrastructure, on energy, on water, on heat, on hospitals, on schools, these, these horrify Americans. They disgust Americans. They enrage Americans. And that will lead to more support for Ukraine, more weapons, heavier duty weapons. We've already seen that begun to come from President Biden, and I think the Congress will support it as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think about nuclear threat? Uh, during the last weeks, uh, Russia was not so active as in previous time. But anyway, should we expect some uh, unpredictable step from Russia in this area, in area of usage nuclear weapons? I don't think so, Vitaly. I don't think so. Um, of course, we cannot rule it out. <clears throat> of course, when when uh, when the Russians have those weapons, you have to worry that they might make a horrible decision, a blunder, a mistake, and, and actually use those. But I think the chances of that are very, very low. As you say, they even they have backed off of, uh, of these kinds of threats. I think even they have realized that these weapons are not useful on the battlefield. They are terrible for the Russian politics. I mean, they are terrible for international support. Uh, so there's no value um, and no reason for them to use these weapons. So I think the chances are very low, but they're not zero. Uh, you, have to, you have to be ready uh, for these. I think the chances are very low. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the grain deal? Uh, is it good for Ukraine or uh, sometime are we here some critics against this uh, agreement? So I think the grain deal is a good thing, is good for Ukraine, it's good for the world food market. Um, I think it's uh, a good thing for, for uh, products to be able to be sold on the international market. Um, I know there is a question about uh, the Russian ammonia. Um, uh, but I think it's very important for Russia, for Ukrainian grain uh, to be sold around the world um, and for Odessa and Mykolaiv um, and other ports on the Black Sea to be open um, for this uh, for this grain to be exported to the rest of the world. Thank you for your time. That you always agreed to comment and to communicate. If you have any questions or or something else uh, free to ask again. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you. Anytime. I'm glad to talk.